the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, as I alluded to earlier, today we have just begun that time that the church calls the season after Pentecost. This liturgical season, as you know, I'm sure, goes all the way to Advent. So it's long. Our Gospels during this long stretch will relate lots of stories to us of the works and the teachings of Jesus during his active ministry. They provide us a framework in which we can deepen our understanding of what Jesus came to do among us and how much God loves us, no matter what. Consequently, we have a good opportunity to deepen our faith and our love for the divine, along with our understanding of God's nature. So. In other words, this long season gives us a chance to do the, the head work to understand and the heart work to believe and to love. Okay. So this year, we're going to be hearing excerpts from Matthew's Gospel as we make our way through this long season. So let's take a look then at today's Gospel. This reading, just tell you something, this reading is especially nostalgic for me since it's the first gospel story I ever preached about, and that was a good 30 years ago. I preached that sermon at Grace Church in Trumbull. Mostly, I remember how incredibly nervous I was, and also how much I learned in the following 30 years. Thanks be to God and also to lots of good people in lots of parishes, who were my teachers. Okay, so let's look at the gospel. I would suggest that we might divide the gospel in half. The first half would be, of course, the story of the calling of Matthew and the disapproval of the Pharisees that followed that. The second half includes the story of the resurrection of the daughter of the synagogue leader and the healing of of the woman with a 12-year-long hemorrhage. Can you imagine? Well, there are a whole lot of things happening in this gospel, aren't there? There's all kinds of stories going on, all kinds of people and all their, what they're thinking and feeling. Oh, man, it's full. But guess what? We can sum it all up with one word. One word. This word also does double duty as it encapsulates for us not only the gospel stories today, but also what happens in Jesus' entire life among us. What's that one word? It's mercy. Mercy. And that word mercy is found actually sitting up just around halfway through the gospel. Interesting. Okay. Well, first of all, let's take a look. Jesus calls Matthew, the tax collector. Follow me, he says. Now, unlike today, when we joke about the IRS and give them begrudging respect, pay our taxes, you know, way back in Jesus' day, the attitude toward tax collectors, this is a really different attitude back then. They were seen as collaborators with the Roman occupiers of Palestine. So they were kind of traitors, right? I mean, they were. They were seen as traitors here, doing their work and enriching the Roman coffers. Moreover, another issue here, the tax collectors were allowed to up people's bills. Tax collectors told people that they owed more than they really did. And that's when they pocketed the profits. Okay, the tax collector, the, or the, the people would pay what the tax collector told them they needed to pay, and then the tax collector would pocket some of the some of the money. So you can see that they were hated because of how they lived and how they made their living. Okay, but Jesus calls this guy, Matthew, 
right from his little tax collector booth, which would have been probably placed right inside the gate to the town. That's because the tax collector could sit there and watch the ingress and egress of people, of traders, of business people coming in and out to do their business and nab them for their taxes very easily. Okay. Now this town, of course, was called Capernaum. Jesus lived there for a while. All right. Later that day, Jesus eats at a house in Capernaum with his friends and also with a bunch of people that the self-righteous Pharisees called tax collectors and sinners. So this little episode gives us a glimpse into the heart of God, doesn't it? Jesus was just fine spending time with people who were often cast out from society as, as losers, as traitors. Hmm. And God is fine with us too, even as we often fall into the category of sinners and losers and traitors sometimes. We are all sinners of all stripes. It's the human condition, isn't it? Well, Jesus explained to these critical Pharisees here that the people he was eating with are the very ones who need God's help. He came to call sinners, not people who are already righteous. He used that great proverb, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick can't argue with that one, right? He cites the prophets and then the Psalms as he follows this by saying, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You have that uh, intimated in the read first reading today from Hosea. Um, they don't translate the word mercy as mercy, unfortunately. It's because if they did, it would hook right in very obviously with the gospel. But anyway, loving kindness, perhaps. I don't remember what word they used, not mercy. But the point is, mercy is used here. This is the whole modus operandi of Jesus' ministry with, with his people and with us too, right? Yeah. It is also the central attribute of the Godhead flowing out from God's nature, God's essence, which is love. So everything that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit do flows from God's central attribute, mercy. Mercy informs Jesus' choice of Matthew as one of his disciples. Isn't that interesting? He has mercy on him. He picks him up. This guy's going to do a good job for me. We just got to need to turn him around a little bit. I'm going to have mercy on him. Okay, great. Mercy informs Jesus' choice of each one of us as his disciples, too. Obviously, right? Thank God. All right. So let's move on to the second half of the gospel now. Here we have these two stories where the mercy of God is unmistakable. First, there was this really heartbreaking scene where a father who was the leader of the synagogue and hence the leader of, of the whole community of Capernaum, he was a high up guy. He comes and pleads with Jesus, but he doesn't just come to Jesus, he kneels before him. Wow, does that ever make a statement? In other words, he's humbling himself in front of this person who is so much greater than he that's a wonderful statement. So he, he comes to him, kneels before him, and pleads with Jesus, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. What kind of faith is that, right? Like, that's outlandish faith. And mercifully, Jesus responds. So as they're walking along to the house, there's another person who confronts Jesus, this time it's a very different person, a woman who has been hemorrhaging blood for 12 years. 
Now, being a woman in that culture, she automatically has reduced status. Being unclean from the flow of blood, she has zero status. This woman would have been considered worthless, someone to be utterly avoided. And I wonder if that explains, really, her approach to Jesus, which is not to come to him face to face and say, oh, I need help, please heal me. No, 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 she doesn't do that. Maybe she thinks she's so darned unworthy, she can't even do that much. So what does she do? She sneaks up on him, right? And she touches a fringe of his cloak. She has such faith that even being that close to him and touching him in that way, his cloak, that she'll get healing. She'll be healed, and she's right. Jesus turns to her, and he says, Take heart, daughter. Ooh, that word daughter. It, it, it gives a kind of a kind of a, a wonderful label to her now. Jesus considers her daughter worthy. He considers her worthy when nobody else would. That's wonderful. Your faith has made you well, he says. He doesn't say, get away from me, you worthless woman. Don't you dare touch me, you unclean woman. Everybody else would say that. Jesus says, your faith has made you well. She's healed instantaneously. There's mercy. Mercy. I see it again, writ large. Now, one last time in today's gospel, we see mercy flowing. Jesus goes into the synagogue leader's house, takes the dead girl by the hand. Now, that is, I mean, that's another breaking of, uh, uh, of what they used to do in the day, right? Because corpses were considered so unclean. If you touched a dead person's body, then you were ritually unclean, and you would have to separate yourself from the community and do all kinds of cleansing things. Oh, it was terrible. So people avoided this, right? Jesus doesn't avoid it. He just takes her by the hand. He just, he just breaks all these, all these rules takes her by the hand. Get up, little girl. There's mercy again. <laughs> Jesus breaks the rules of life and death to show mercy to this child and to her parents. Wow. You know, we, we often, I don't know about you, let me talk about myself. I often lose sight of who this Jesus really was. Look what he did in this little story to good heavens. He loved these people so much. He broke the rules. He went to them. He touched them. He, he connected with them. And they weren't worthy people. He did it anyway. Wow. Well, we are all partakers in God's mercy and in God's very being. We are acceptable. And no matter what kind of baggage we might carry from our early years or from our current years, who knows, or no matter how unclean we feel, God finds us to be a source of delight and a treasure of joy. Go figure. We have been given mercy in abundance, and it's still pouring out. Now, the logical question follows. Do we, we also give mercy to others because it's joyful, because it's right, because it's a privilege to partake in this attribute of the divine? Think about this for yourself. I've been thinking about it for me. What relationships do we have right now with people we might not like, people we don't agree with. The 
that can benefit from us pouring mercy out despite everything else, that connection we can make with these people who get on our nerves really bad. What would it mean to pour mercy on them? What would it mean to invite God to work on our hearts to such an extent that, that we're changed around like that? Wow. What can we work on? What relationships can we access that aren't great relationships? In a merciful way to bring more goodness and kindness to our struggling world. That's the lesson for us. So now I'm going to end this reflection with a command of Jesus, following up on this question here, a command of Jesus that we hear at the end of the story of the Good Samaritan. And that's in a different gospel, isn't it? That's in Luke, but it doesn't matter. Still Jesus. He says to the people listening to him, tell that story. He says, the good Samaritan showed him mercy. And then he says, go and do likewise. Amen.
Lord God, we pray for those who have been injured, for their families, for their for those first responders who had to deal with unimaginable, awful things. God bless them. Bring them bring them help and peace. We pray for the earth, which right now is burning a lot in Canada. Some of those forests, we pray for the forests. We pray as well for the firefighters, uh, the animals and the, the trees and the, the whole thing. Dear God, pray for those who are suffering from um, respiratory distress because of the smoke. We pray for the people of Ukraine and all war-torn countries. We pray for the people of Russia. We pray for peace, whatever that means, a just peace. We pray for those struggling with addiction and for their families and friends. For students of all ages who are graduating, we pray for them and we give thanks for their hard work. And we pray for, oh, for Rocky and all other companion animals who have died. Oh, Rocky. Giving thanks as well for our regular pets who bring us such joy. Oh, Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercy, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And now, turning back in the Book of Common Prayer to page 360, let us confess our sins against God and our Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on me. Forgive you all your sins, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. Are we on? Okay. Um, please be seated for announcements. Uh, would anybody like to give, I mean, I'm not going to do the announcements, but anybody here like to do announcements or mention something that's important or whatever? Well, that's simple. <laughs> I'm sure there are some things written up on your bulletin. I don't know. Okay. I'm just a supply brain. Yes, ma'am. It's wonderful in Roxbury at which it, at the Congregation of Church. Fabulous. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, good luck to her. All right. So walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. 